Today I'd like to introduce you to the basics of working in Adobe Illustrator. To begin, let's just familiarize ourselves with the interface of working in Illustrator. Here you see a window, and the window consists of something called the artboard, which is that large gray area in the background, and we can draw artwork anywhere on that uh, gray area. And then the white area is the actual printable area. In this case, I've created a typical 8.5 by 11 page. Anything that I draw within the white printable area is going to print when I actually print out the artwork. Anything that I place in the gray area uh, outside of the printed area will not print, although uh, Illustrator will still save that artwork. So, for example, I could create some objects in the printed area, and of course, when I go to print the file, these objects will print, but I could create additional objects and simply leave them out here in the margins temporarily, and when I print this page, those objects will not, will not appear in the print. Sometimes I'll actually create artwork intentionally on the artboard, off to the side, and then when I've completed it, I'll drag it into the printed area. So sometimes I use the artboard as just a temporary workspace uh, for sketching and doodling, and then when I've created something I like, that's when I actually bring it into the artboard. But I always try to make a habit of deleting any objects from the artboard after I'm done with them, leaving only the artwork that I really want here in the printed space. I think it's a good habit to get into to get rid of any extraneous artwork uh, that you happen to leave here uh, outside the borders of, of the printed area. In addition to the artboard and the printed area here in white, you see that as with any graphic software, there are a group of menus across the top and lots and lots of options and choices that we'll explore as the course goes on. There's a toolbar which you can pick up and reposition anywhere you want it on screen. The toolbar contains the basic tools that you'll use for drawing objects, for selecting and moving objects, editing objects, and a whole bunch of other options. Uh, again, we'll explore these as the course continues. I usually keep the toolbar positioned off to the far left, but you can move it anywhere that, that you prefer. There are also a number of palettes that can be repositioned anywhere on screen. Here we see the color palette, the stroke palette, layers palette, and a whole bunch of other palettes. Each of the palettes can be turned on so that it's visible, or they can be hidden. If you have a palette on screen that you'd like to hide for some reason, simply click the tiny little X in the upper left-hand corner of the palette, and it disappears. If we want to hide the stroke palette, we simply click that little X and it disappears. But now how do we get them back if we decide later that we want them again? All of the palettes can be turned on and off in the window menu. When I click on the window menu, you'll see that there's a long list of palettes here that I can choose from and make some visible and some invisible. Any palette that currently has a check mark next to it is something that's currently visible. So here's the Align palette, and if I look down here, I see that the Align palette is one that was already visible on screen. Any of the palettes that don't have a check marks next to them are ones that are currently hidden. So if I want to turn the color palette back on, I simply select the color palette from the window menu, and it reappears in my workspace. If I want to go back and get that stroke palette again, I go back to the window menu and I select the stroke palette to make it visible. The palettes can be nested together. In other words, they can be joined together so that they move together as a group. So for example, let me take the Align palette and I can drag it over to this other group of palettes and if I place it near the bottom of this other one called Pathfinder, notice there's a little blue stripe that appears and when I let go of the mouse, the Align palette has actually been joined to the other palette above, or the other group of palettes above, 
And so now these move together as a group. And I do this quite frequently where I'll actually take palettes and nest them together so that I can easily move a whole group of palettes out of the way if I find that they're, that they're in my way. Something else I should point out is that each of the palettes also has a little options button located here in the upper right hand corner of each palette. If I click on this tiny little icon in the upper corner, upper right corner of each palette, I can choose to hide additional options which are visible. So here you see that the color palette can be reduced to just this little rainbow icon. Or I can go back to that little icon in the upper right corner and I can say show options and that brings us back to what the palette looked like originally. The stroke palette also has some options which are currently hidden. Right now we only see the weight of the stroke which refers to the thickness of the outline on an object. We'll talk more about that later. But I can click on the little options icon and I can say show options and you'll see that there are a whole lot of other things that I can do with the stroke. I can create dashed lines, I can add arrowheads to my, to my lines, uh, and a number of other options. Whenever you sit down to learn a new piece of software, it can be a little overwhelming because there are so many choices. You've got quite a few palettes up here, each of which contains many submenus. You've got quite a few tools in the toolbar, and you've got lots of floating palettes. that perform a variety of specialized functions. But don't be intimidated by all of the choices. I've been working with Illustrator for over 20 years, and I can tell you from my own experience that it's possible to create good quality professional artwork by mastering just three basic principles. If you can learn how to use the basic drawing tools in Illustrator, such as the pen tool, the pencil tool, and a couple of other drawing tools, and if you can learn how to select objects using just these two arrow tools on the toolbar, you can start creating pretty good artwork. And finally, if you can learn how to edit that artwork using things like the Rotate tool and the Reflect tool, the Scale tool and the Shear tool, as well as a couple of palettes such as the Pathfinder palette and the Align palette. If you can master just those three basic things, drawing shapes, selecting shapes, and modifying or editing shapes, you can create good quality professional artwork. So my goal today is to introduce the first two of those topics, to show you the basic drawing tools and to show you the selection tools for selecting and moving those objects or selecting and moving parts of the individual objects that you've created. And then in a subsequent lecture, I'll talk about modifying and editing those objects. So let me clear these objects off of the artboard and we'll start with a blank canvas. Let's begin by talking about the drawing tools. The first tool I want to introduce is the pen tool. I'm going to simply click it to select it here on the toolbar and you'll notice that the icon uh, appears like the end of, a, of an old quill pen. In my experience the pen tool is the single most important tool in Illustrator. It is the tool that you will probably use for creating the vast majority of your artwork. As we discussed in a previous lecture, every object in Illustrator consists of anchor points that are connected together by line segments or pads. The pen tool allows you to create the anchor points and then they are automatically connected together by pads and this is how you create objects in Illustrator. 
There are three different approaches to using the pen tool in Illustrator, and these are used for creating different types of objects. The simplest approach to working in Illustrator is to simply click with the mouse to create a single anchor point, and then click a second time to create a second anchor point, and Illustrator automatically creates this path that connects the two anchor points together. You can then continue to click to add additional anchor points, and Illustrator draws additional paths connecting all of the anchor points together. It's kind of like a game of connect the dots. You simply draw the dots or the anchor points and Illustrator draws in the lines to connect them together. Right now this object is what we call an open shape, meaning that it has two distinct endpoints, a beginning point and an endpoint, and those two points are not connected together but I could create a closed shape, a completely enclosed shape, by simply clicking again on the starting point and notice that the pen tool gets a little circle icon in the lower right corner that tells me that I'm about to enclose this shape into a closed object. So I click that one last time and that creates one final line segment or one final path it connects these last two points together. So now I have a completely enclosed shape. This approach to using the pen tool is fine if you want to create objects that are very angular, that have perfectly straight lines and sharp corner points. But the majority of what you'll be illustrating as a medical illustrator doesn't consist of straight lines and sharp corners. You want to create objects that have a more natural feel to them that have smooth curves. In order to create curved objects, you have to use the pen tool a little bit differently. Let me demonstrate. Once again, you click with the pen tool to create an initial anchor point. But don't let go of the mouse right away. Click with your mouse and then drag the mouse in any direction that you want. And you'll notice that this creates an anchor point, just as we saw in the previous example. But the anchor point has these two thin little lines extending out from the center, and there are these tiny little tips at the ends of those lines. Those little lines will not print. Those lines are not actually part of an object. Instead, those lines are what are called control bars, or I usually refer to them as handlebars. And we'll see in just a minute that those control bars or handlebars allow you to control the curvature of the path that connects to that anchor point. So all I've really created right now is just a single point. There is no path yet until I click and create a second anchor point. So let me move the pen tool a little bit away, away from that initial point. And now I'm going to click a second time. And once again, I'm going to hold the mouse button down and drag the mouse, and this drags out a set of control bars or handlebars that are associated with this second anchor point. And notice what's happened now. Instead of Illustrator simply drawing a straight path to connect these first two points, Illustrator has drawn a curved path. The curvature of the path follows the orientation of those handlebars that I created as I drag the mouse uh, away from uh, the anchor point. So you'll notice right here that this part of the curve is roughly parallel to that handlebar. But then as we move farther away from the initial anchor point, the curve begins to diverge or deviate away from the handlebar towards the second anchor point. As the curve begins to approach the second anchor point, it becomes parallel to this other handlebar or this other control bar. Now let me click a third point, and as I begin to drag, notice that the more I drag the handlebars, the more it's pushing the curve 
down towards the lower left. Now this is a little bit hard to get used to because I'm actually dragging the mouse towards the right and yet there's a handlebar that's also appearing on the left hand side of that anchor point which is the pushing the curve back towards the left. Now I'm going to create a fourth point down here and this time I'm dragging the mouse towards the left but it's also creating a handlebar towards the right which is pushing the curve farther and farther to the right. And the more I drag this handlebar, the longer I make those control bars, the more it pushes the curve towards the far right. Now I'm going to draw a fifth anchor point and drag. And as in the previous example, this is not a completely enclosed shape yet. This is simply a curving line that has a beginning point and an end point. If I want to create a completely enclosed shape, I have to now position the mouse or the cursor back over the beginning point and notice again that the pen tool gets that little O symbol in the bottom right corner indicating that when I click again I have now completely enclosed this as an enclosed shape. So those are two ways of using the pen tool. Simply clicking the mouse without dragging to play connect the dots, creating a series of anchor points connected by straight pads and they join one another at sharp corners. Or in the second case, clicking and dragging the mouse to drag out these control bars or handlebars to create curved pads connecting the anchor points together. Before I show you the third approach to using the pen tool, let me demonstrate something on this second curve path that I created. I'll show you later in this video how to use the different selection tools, but for right now I'll just mention to you that I've, I've grabbed one of the selection arrows and I'm going to use it to select one of the anchor points that I created on this path. And notice when I select this anchor point that it activates the control bars or handlebars on either side of that anchor point. It also activates some of the handlebars on neighboring points as well. When I grab the tips of the handlebars, I can actually rotate or move the handlebars to change the orientation of the curve at that anchor point. Notice that the handlebars are rotating around that central anchor point. What I want to point out to you is that as I drag the handlebar on one side of the anchor point and move it in a certain direction, the handlebar on the opposite side of the anchor point moves in the opposite direction so that the two handlebars remain parallel to one another at all times. The purpose of this is to make sure that the curve is always perfectly smooth as it passes through that anchor point and doesn't have a sharp kink in it at that point. So notice as I rotate one handlebar, the other handlebar moves with it to ensure that the curve is nice and smooth as it passes through that point. But what if I don't want that? What if I actually want a sharp corner at that point? What if I want a sort of kink in the line? That brings us to this third approach to using the pen tool. Let me select both of these paths and delete them to make some more room to create a new object. I'll go back to the toolbar and grab the pen tool and let me demonstrate how I would create a path that intentionally has a sharp corner in it or a kink between two different curved objects. I'll start off by just creating a simple point and dragging out a set of handlebars. Now I'm going to create a second point. And again notice as I drag the mouse to the right, it's dragging a handlebar towards the right, but it's also pushing an equally sized handlebar off to the left. 
And as I just demonstrated, if I were to grab one of the selection tools and move these handlebars around, as I moved the right handlebar, the left handlebar would move in the opposite direction. In order to ensure that the curve passing through this point would be nice and smooth. But what I want to do in this case is I want to intentionally create a sharp corner here and I want to have two independent handlebars to control the curves on both sides of that anchor point. For example, let's say I wanted to create something that looked like the crest of a wave, where the wave comes up on one side, reaches a sharp point here at the crest of the wave, and then it turns back underneath, forming a curve that goes in a different direction. Here's how I would do that. At this point, I would hold down the Option key on the keyboard. And notice that the pen tool changes to this upside-down V-shaped icon. But when I position the cursor back over that anchor point, I see that the pen tool reappears, but notice that the pen tool has that little upside-down V icon in the lower right corner. I'm still holding down the Option key. Now when I click and drag a second time, I can drag out a new handlebar which goes in a different direction. I'm now going to click a third point and drag, and I've created that crest of a wave type appearance that I wanted. I'm going to go back to the toolbar and grab the white selection tool, and I'm going to click on this anchor point at the crest of the wave. And we see that the anchor point still has two handlebars associated with it but the two handlebars are no longer connected together. I can move the handlebars independently of one another. So when I grab this handlebar and move it, it no longer causes the handlebar on the other side to move in the opposite direction. So I have two independent handlebars that allow me to intentionally put a kink in the line to create something that looks like a crest of a wave or I could drag this handlebar around this way to create a different type of shape. So this technique of holding down the Option key allows me to create a sharp corner between two curved paths. Let me go back to the Pen tool again and demonstrate that another time. Once again, I'm going to hold down the Option key I'm going to go to this endpoint of the path, and I'm going to drag, click and drag in a different direction. Let me do that again. Hold down the Option key, click and drag, and you can see that it creates an independent handlebar. I'll do it one more time. So you see how this allows me to create all kinds of different uh, angles uh, between my curved paths. And once again, I can enclose this shape by simply clicking back on the starting point. So to quickly summarize, there are three different approaches to using the pen tool. The simplest method is to simply click without dragging the mouse, click, 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 and play a little game of connect the dots to create straight pads and sharp cornered points. The second method is to click and drag with the mouse as you create each anchor point to create smooth curved shapes. The third approach is to also click and drag with the mouse, but at a certain point you may decide that you want to put a sharp corner in here, so you hold down the Option key, click on that same point again, and it allows you to create a curve that changes direction. And again, clicking with the Option key to change direction. So three different types of shapes that can be created with the pen tool. Now I'd like to give you some pointers for creating better quality shapes. What I mean by that is shapes that are going to print better and shapes that are going to be easier to edit. And I find that a lot of people who are just starting out with Illustrator make certain common mistakes and I want to try to help you avoid making those same mistakes. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. The first common mistake that I see students making is that they try to use too many anchor points. 
when they're trying to draw a shape, they will draw lots and lots of little points very closely together. thinking that this is somehow going to allow them more control and more accuracy in creating a particular shape. The problem with this, which you may already be able to see, is that it creates a shape which is kind of rough and, and wiggly and doesn't have the smoothness that you could get if you used fewer points. Another problem with this approach is that this path would be very difficult to edit because if you tried to change one aspect of this object, you'd have to move a lot of points. Let me grab one of the arrow keys, the white arrow, and try to grab one of these anchor points to try to move part of the path around. And you notice if I want to change the bump, this particular bump on this shape, I have to move quite a few anchor points around in order to, to change that particular shape to, to edit the path. A much better approach is to try to create the same shape using the smallest possible number of points. So let me see if I can replicate that basic shape above, but using fewer anchor points. So I click and drag out a fairly long set of handlebars. I keep the points spaced apart pretty widely so that the points aren't all crowded up against one another and fairly quickly I was able to reproduce more or less the same shape. It's not identical but it's pretty close using fewer points. Let's see if we can actually count the points. In the first object we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on whereas in this other shape just one, two, three to replicate pretty much that same section of the path. So I think you'll have better results if you use the fewest possible number of points to create any given shape. The shape will appear smoother and it becomes much more easy to edit. So if I wanted to edit this little hump here, I could move just one point or perhaps just a couple instead of moving a whole bunch of points. The second problem that I see frequently when people are first learning Illustrator is that they get their anchor points too close together so that the control bars or handlebars actually end up crossing one another. Let me show you what I mean. So you start out by clicking one point and dragging out a set of handlebars. For many people, the temptation is to draw the second point or create the second point very close to the tip of the handlebar. And maybe it's because they think that that handlebar is actually part of the path. But you have to remember that that handlebar is not actually part of the path. The handlebar is just a control point that controls the curvature of this path. But for whatever reason, they'll click the second point very close to the first point. And as they drag now a second time, you'll notice how the handlebars from these two points are crossing one another. I call this sword fighting where these are like two crossed swords fighting one another. And you can see what happens is that the curve ends up with this sharp kink in the middle of it, which you may not want. Now let me grab the white arrow and show you how you'd fix that. You'd have to make the handlebars much shorter so that you eliminate that crisscrossing or that sword fighting of the handlebars. But the way to avoid that in the first place is to make sure that you always click the second point far away from the handlebars of the first point. So we'll do this again. I'll start out by clicking and dragging out a fairly long set of handlebars. My next point needs to be pretty far away from the end of that handlebar. So let's put the second point way over here and now we click and drag. And you can see now that the handlebars from these two points are no longer crossing one another. We've eliminated that sword fighting problem. And now the third point, I want to move it also quite a ways away from this handlebar on the second point. So we'll click the third point way over here 
Once again, I've avoided that crisscrossing or sword fighting handlebar problem to eliminate any kind of strange kinks or loops that might appear in the path. Once you've created any object, you can easily give this object a fill color and a stroke. The fill color refers to the color of the contents of the object, the interior of the object. And in order to apply a fill color to an object, you generally want to use the color palette. Notice that the color palette has two little square icons here towards the upper left corner. One icon appears as a solid square. And if I hover the cursor over that solid square, you'll see that it actually says fill. There's a second square, which appears to be a black outline with a hollow center. And this says stroke. If the fill square, this white square, appears to be in the foreground, in other words, the white square is overlapping the black outline square, that means that anything I do now to the colors is going to affect the fill of the object. Alternatively, I could click on the stroke square, that black outline square, and see how that now jumps to the foreground. Anything I do now to the colors is going to affect the stroke of the object. So I can switch back and forth to fill in order to control the fill color of the object, or click on that outline box to control the stroke color. You can also do this on the keyboard just by hitting the X key. X toggles you back and forth between working on the fill and working on the stroke. When I have the fill selected, anything I do with these sliders, in this case I'm working in CMYK color, anything I do with these sliders is going to add color to the interior of the object. So let me put in some cyan. And then maybe I can add a little bit of magenta. Maybe add some black to make it darker. Notice as I move the sliders around that it's also changing the numerical values that are entered over here as a percentage. I actually prefer to enter numbers directly as percentages of cyan, magenta, yellow, and black ink. Now I've been doing this for a long time, so for me, working in CMYK has become fairly intuitive. And if I know that I want to create a particular color, I can usually enter numerical values directly into these boxes here fairly quickly and achieve the color that, that I want. So if I wanted a pale green, I know that I could put in something like 30% magenta uh, I'm actually going to just hit the tab key on the keyboard and that'll tab me into the next space, magenta, and then I can tab to the yellow and put in, say, 20% yellow and then hit return. And I end up with this pale green color. Or if I wanted a uh, purple, I could, say, put in, let's say, 40% cyan, tab into the magenta, let's put in, say, 80% magenta, and then in the yellow I want to put a zero. I don't want any yellow in there. And that gives me a kind of violet or, or purple color. You can either use these sliders to simply slide the different values of ink up and down, or you can enter numbers directly in here. One thing I don't want you to do, and this is very important, is I don't want you to use this little rainbow down here. Apparently, that's what a lot of people who work in Illustrator use in order to select colors, either for the fill or the stroke of their object. As a matter of fact, when you first open Illustrator, the default is to have the options hidden. And the only way to choose a color for your object is to click on this little rainbow. I think that's a really bad idea. Because you never really know exactly what color you're getting as you click. If we go back and show the options within the color palette, you can see that I end up with some pretty weird percentages. 80.39% cyan, 17.25% magenta, 100% yellow, and 4.71% black. 
it's hard to know how that color is really going to print. And we'll talk in class a lot more about how to actually specify colors using percentages of CMYK. So I don't want to get bogged down in that whole discussion. But I think you're always better off entering specific percentages directly into the little boxes here uh, in the color palette and avoid using this little rainbow spectrum down here. In addition to colors, you also have the option of filling an object with white. Now, that doesn't look any different from the background, but I know if I created another object that has a white fill color, you can see how this new rectangle hides part of that blob shape in the background because the fill is white. I could also fill an object with black, and you'll notice in the CMYK sliders that that's 100% K. Or I could give an object no fill. In other words, the interior would be completely hollow. It would have no fill. You achieve that by clicking on this little square with the red slash in it, which says none. And you see now there's no fill color in that rectangle, and it allows that blob shape in the background to show through the middle. I have the same choices for the stroke. I could give it a pure white stroke. And you may be able to tell, if I, especially if I deselect this, that that white stroke has actually created a little break on the black line behind it. That'll be more noticeable if I increase the size of the stroke. I could give it a stroke of none, in which case the stroke, there is no stroke. So now that rectangular object, it, it's still there, but since it has no fill and no stroke, it simply disappears. Let me put a stroke of white back on there again. Or I could use the CMYK sliders to give it a color. Let's give it an orange. And let's increase the stroke weight to make that more obvious. Now when I go to create a new object by selecting the pen tool, the next object I create is automatically going to have the fill and stroke attributes of the last object that I created. So since I had just created a rectangle that had a five point thick orange stroke and had a fill of none, this new object that I just created retains those same parameters. If I want to change the fill or the stroke color of this new object, I'd simply go back into my color palette, give it a different fill or a different stroke. Or if I'm about to create a new object, I may not want the fill and stroke color of the previous object, I can go ahead and change the fill and stroke to something different before I start drawing a new object. Then the object will have whatever new parameters I've entered in the color palette. Before we move on to something new, let me demonstrate a few other simple tools for creating objects and shapes. There's something called a line segment tool that allows you to create simple line segments. I don't use that very often. There's an arc tool that allows you to create arcs. Once again, don't use that very often. There's a spiral tool. Allows you to create things that look like snail shells. Believe it or not, I've actually used this tool in medical illustration for illustrating things like the cochlea which is a spiral shaped organ in the inner ear. There's another tool on the tool palette that allows you to create all sorts of different geometric shapes, such as rectangles. You can create wide rectangles, tall skinny rectangles, and if you want to create a perfect square, you hold down the shift key while you're creating the rectangle, and this constrains the proportions 
so that the height and width are identical to create a perfect square. In addition to simply dragging to draw one of these shapes, you can also enter precise numerical measurements for the height and width of the object. To do this, you simply take the rectangle tool and just click with the mouse. And it brings up this little dialog box where you can enter an exact size. And if you wanted a perfect square, you'd simply make sure that the height and width were equal. There's a rounded rectangle tool which is very similar. The only difference is that the rectangle doesn't have sharp corners. It's a little hard to see here, but the corners are actually slightly rounded on this rectangle. Now just like with the regular rectangular tool, you can simply click with the mouse to bring up a dialog box to enter a certain size, but notice that there's an additional value here called the corner radius, which allows you to control just how much curvature there is at the corners of the rectangle. So let's set this to a larger value so that it'll be more obvious when I create the rectangle. The larger I set that value, the broader the curves at the corners. There's also an ellipse tool. It allows you to create very flat ellipses, tall skinny ellipses, and similar to the rectangle tool, you can create a perfect circle by holding down the shift key, which constrains the proportions so that the height and width are the same. Or as with any of these geometric shape tools, you can simply click and enter values directly. There's a polygon tool, which by default creates hexagons. Or you can click, specify the radius of the object, and control the number of sides. As I said, the default is a hexagon with six sides, but I could create a, a pentagon with five sides, even a triangle with just three sides, or something with more sides. I'll show you a little trick. As you drag to create one of these objects, you can hit the up or down arrows on the keyboard to either increase or decrease the number of sides. Now the last object that I had created was a dodecahedron with 12 sides, so by default this next object I'm creating has the same number of sides, but I'm going to hit the down arrow to reduce that to 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Of course you can't go below 3 because of polygon can't have fewer than three sides. And I can do the opposite. I can drag and hit the up arrows while I'm still dragging. Four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. And finally, there's a star tool, which by default creates a five-pointed star. You can click with this tool as well and control the size of the outer points of the star, called radius 1, as well as the size of the inner radius. So let me put 60 points for the tips of the points of the star, and say 24 points for the size of, of the interior of the star, and click OK. And I can even create stars that have more or fewer points. I could create a six-pointed star or more. Just as with the polygon tool, as I'm dragging, I can hit the up or down arrows to either increase or decrease the number of points on the star. The last tool I'm going to show you today is called the Blob Brush Tool, located here in the toolbar.
the blob brush tool allows you to simply scribble to create irregular and complex shapes. So I'm just going to keep scribbling here for a minute to create just some sort of random irregular shape. When I'm all done, I can select that shape with one of the arrow tools and you can see that it's created a completely enclosed shape made out of anchor points and pads. I can play around with the fill color. I could give it a stroke just like any other object. Notice there are some little blank areas in here because I didn't completely fill in the interior of the space so the stroke actually uh, surrounds some little gaps in the interior of the object. I can increase the stroke a little bit. If I grab this with the black arrow it picks up the entire thing and moves it around. I can actually control the size of the blob brush. Notice that when I select the blob brush tool there's a circle that defines the size of the brush. In this case it filled it in with a solid black color. Let's give it a different color and then add a stroke to it. But I can change the size of that circle which represents the diameter of the brush. I can do that by simply double clicking on the blob brush tool icon in the toolbar. Down here at the bottom we have a control for the size. So I can increase the diameter of the blob brush tool. I can also change it from being a round brush to being more of an oval brush and I can even orient that oval at different angles. So let's try this. Now I have this angled ellipse shape tool and once again I'm going to give that a different color and give it a stroke. Let me double click on the blob brush tool again. Let's return this to a perfectly round shape and let's reduce the size somewhat. And we go back down to a tool that's about the size that we started with originally. There's actually an easier way to control the size of the blob brush tool and this is something that you can do on the fly instead of having to constantly click on the blob brush tool icon. So I'm going to just select the tool and on the keyboard I'm going to use the bracket keys. The right hand bracket, if I keep pressing it, increases the size of the blob brush. The left hand bracket reduces the size of the brush and you can see how that little circle on screen is getting smaller and smaller. So that's a real quick way on the fly to control the size of this tool. Finally let me talk a little bit about editing these objects. And I'm going to talk about two basic things. There are a couple of selection arrows at the top of the tool palette. There are also some other options under the pen tool icon that I can access that allow me to edit objects. Let's talk first about the selection arrows. There are actually three different selection arrows. There's a blank arrow that Illustrator simply calls the selection tool. There's a white arrow that Illustrator calls the direct selection tool. And if I click and hold down the mouse on the white arrow icon, we can see that there's another selection arrow called the group selection tool. It's a white arrow with a little plus sign next to it. I have to say I don't like the names that Illustrator uses for these different arrows, for these different selection tools. I find the names to be a little bit misleading, especially the name of this thing called the group selection tool. It does kind of the opposite of what the name suggests. So I simply refer to these as the black arrow, 
the white arrow, and the white arrow with a plus sign. And let me demonstrate what each of them does. The black arrow allows you to select an entire object or an entire group of objects and move the entire object around. So let's say I want to select this white blob object in the background with the, with the uh, black outline. All I have to do is position the cursor over the edge of the object with that black arrow, click on it, and it lets me pick it up and move it around. It, it, it automatically selects the entire shape. It selects every anchor point and all of the paths that connect those anchor points together. If I want to deselect that object, I simply click in the middle of empty space with the selection tool and it deselects the object. And if I want to collect, select this rectangle, I just grab the edge of the rectangle and I can pick up and move around the whole thing. And again, if I want to deselect, I simply click out in the middle of empty space to deselect objects. So the black arrow selects the entire object. We haven't talked about groups yet, but let me just show you something very quickly and we'll come back to this in more detail later. If I select two objects, and I'm just going to I'm going to drag a selection that touches both the blob in the background and the rectangle. Since I did that with the black arrow, it has completely selected both shapes. I can go to the object menu and say group. And what that's done is it's joined these two objects together in a group. So now if I select one object with the black arrow, it actually selects both and allows me to move them together. So the black arrow can select individual objects if they're not part of a group, or if the object is part of a larger group of objects, it selects the entire group. Let's change now to the plain white arrow, what Illustrator calls the direct selection tool. The white arrow allows you to select individual parts of an object. You can select an individual anchor point or the individual path segment between two anchor points. So let me click on that white blob first. I'm going to click right on the edge of it. And notice when I do that, a couple of handlebars appear. What I've done here is I've actually clicked on the segment of path that connects these two anchor points together. The anchor points themselves are not selected, and you can just barely see that by the fact that the anchor point is filled in with white. The middle of the anchor point is not solid blue. Uh, there's a little white speck in the middle of, of that uh, anchor point. So I've simply selected the path that lies between the anchor points, and I can actually drag that path in or out and notice what happens to the handlebars as I move it around. Or I could select the anchor point itself. I could select this anchor point, for example, and then that allows me to move that anchor point around, and you notice how the paths reflow automatically as I change the position of the anchor point. The white arrow also allows me to select the handlebars, which control the orientation of the path and the curvature of the path. So I could grab one of these handlebars and drag it around to change the orientation of the curve as it passes through the center of that anchor point. I can also extend the handlebar, make it longer, which is going to push the curve away from the anchor point. Or I can grab that handlebar and drag it back towards the point which brings the curve in closer to the anchor point. If I do this on the rectangle, I can grab one path. So I can grab the left edge of this and pick it up and move it around. Or I could grab just a single anchor point and move just that one anchor point. I can also grab a group of anchor points by clicking and dragging a box around the end of an object. And what that's done is it's allowed me to select two anchor points that lie at the end of this shape. And I can then pick that up and move those two anchor points around 
simultaneously. Or I could drag an even bigger selection and capture four anchor points and move those four anchor points around, while the other two anchor points which are not selected remain in their original position. Finally, we have the white arrow with the plus sign, which Illustrator calls the Group Selection Tool. Now here's why I find the name to be confusing. You might think that the Group Selection Tool would allow you to select a group of objects. In fact, it's just the opposite. Remember that earlier I had grouped that white blob and the orange rectangle together. If I were to select those shapes, either of those shapes, with the black arrow, it selects the entire group and moves them around. So really you'd think the black arrow is the one that should be called the group selection tool because it lets you select entire groups of objects. If I use the white arrow with the plus sign, that actually lets me select an entire object which is part of a group but without selecting the rest of the group. So as I said, the name is kind of backwards. It doesn't let me select the entire group. Instead, it lets me select one object which is part of a larger group and yet move that object independently of the rest of the group. Finally, I want to show you the other tools that are hiding under the pen tool icon here in the toolbar. You'll notice that many of the tools in the toolbar have this little black triangle in the bottom right corner. That indicates that there are other tools that you can access by clicking and holding down the mouse button on that tool icon. So all of these tools have multiple other options. So let's look at the other options that are available under the pen tool. We have the pen tool itself, and we have something called the add anchor point tool. This tool is very simple. It simply adds anchor points to an existing shape. Notice that it looks just like the pen tool icon, except that it has a little plus sign in the bottom right corner. I can click on any existing path, and it allows me to add additional anchor points to that existing object. I can then grab my selection arrow and edit the object by grabbing any of those new points that I've created. So if you have an object that's very simple, but you need to make it more complex by giving it more points, you can simply add additional points with this Add Anchor Point tool. One thing to notice about the Add Anchor Point tool is that even though I'm adding additional points, it's not altering the shape of the object. The object retains its shape, even though there are more anchor points being added. There's another tool hiding under the pen tool called the Delete Anchor Point tool. And as you might guess, this simply deletes anchor points from an object. Notice that the icon is a little pen tool with a minus sign. But there's one important difference here. When I delete an anchor point, it actually modifies the shape of the object. Illustrator is not able to retain the shape of that object if I delete some of the anchor points. So notice as I delete anchor points that it significantly changes the shape of the object. I can also do this on the rectangle and change it into a triangle. The last tool that's hiding here under the pen tool is called the Convert Anchor Point tool. Notice that its icon looks like a little upside down V. You remember at the beginning of this lecture I described three different ways of using the pen tool. The first was the simple click 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 connect the dots method of creating just straight paths and sharp corners. Then I showed you a second technique to create smooth objects with smooth curves. And then the third technique allowed you to create objects that consisted of curves, but sometimes those curves would meet one another at a sharp angle. 
The Convert Anchor Point tool allows you to convert back and forth between those different types of objects. So for example, on this curved shape here at the bottom, if I knew where the anchor points were, I could click on them with this tool. I actually have to grab my selection arrow and select this object first so that I can see where the anchor points are. And let me go back and grab that Convert Anchor Point tool. The Convert Anchor Point tool will convert a smooth point into a sharp corner point by simply clicking on the point. So I can click here and that nice smooth curve has now become a corner. I click here and here and here and I've changed this object from being a nice smooth object consisting of curved paths into a very angular object consisting of straight line segments and sharp corners. I could also do the opposite. I could take a sharp corner and convert it back into a smooth point. But to do this, I have it's a two-step process. I have to click on the point, but then while I'm holding the mouse button down, I have to drag, which allows me to restore the handlebars that used to be on that point. So I click and drag to drag out a new set of handlebars on each of those corner points. I could even do that with something like this triangle. I can tell where the corner points are on the triangle because I can, they obviously lie at the corners of the shape. So I can simply click here and drag out a set of handlebars at each of those corner points. I can also use the Convert Anchor Point tool to convert this type of point where the handlebars function in unison. In other words, I drag one handlebar and the handlebar on the opposite side moves with it. I can use the Convert Anchor Point tool to, in a sense, break those handlebars so that one handlebar in functions independently of the other. All I have to do is use the Convert Anchor Point tool and click on the tips of the handlebars and that breaks the handlebars so that now the two handlebars associated with that corner point behave independently of one another. Let me show you that again. Grab the Convert Anchor Point tool and click on the end point of one of these handlebars and it breaks the handlebars so that when I move one handlebar associated with that anchor point, the handlebar on the other side doesn't move with it. 